Hi, my name is Josh. Today we're going to be talking about heart failure with the goal being to establish a 10,000 foot view approach for the evaluation and management of these patients. Heart failure can either be defined as the inability to pump to meet the body's demands, which is systolic heart failure, or the inability to do so at normal filling pressures, which is diastolic heart failure. Today we're going to be focusing on systolic heart failure, although we do commonly take care of diastolic heart failure patients in the hospital. There are many different frameworks for thinking through a heart failure patient. The one that I like uses this two by two table approach. And the reason I like it is because it ties nicely to some of the pathophysiologic concepts of the Frank Starling curve. Let's take a look. So heart failure patients can be classified on two spectrum. The first is volume, where they can range from dry to wet. And then perfusion, where they can range from warm to cold. On the Starling curve, we see that on the x-axis we have volume, which is really a surrogate for end diastolic pressure and volume and pump function. These two are neatly tied via the sarcomere relationship in the myocytes, where as you increase your volume, the sarcomeres become more optimally overlapped up until a point here at the apex of the curve, and then following that, they become so stretched out that they don't pump quite as efficiently, and you see a decrement in pump function. So let's talk about the first heart failure patient, the person who's dry and warm. This is a patient who's managed in a heart failure clinic. They live predominantly close to the top of the apex of this starling curve here. They may range around a little bit based upon medication, dosing, meal, uh, meal timing, that sort of thing. But for the most part, they live here at the top of the starling curve. They're asymptomatic, they're relatively euvolemic, and they're well maintained. They generally have a medication regimen that includes a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or an ARB, and a standing PO diuretic although sometimes a PRN diuretic is used as well. So what happens when these compensated patients become decompensated? For me, it helps to have this imaginary line here on the Starling curve. When the patient gets more wet, uh, this can be either via missed medication doses, very salty meal, they eventually increase their volume to the point where they cross this imaginary line on the Starling curve and develop symptoms. What symptoms might they develop? That really depends on if they have right heart failure or left heart failure or both, each of which has its own signs and symptoms. Regardless, once the patient crosses this line, they will develop symptoms. They'll often uh, present to medical care. And this is the person who presented from an outpatient and is now admitted to the Bigelow medical floor for further management. So the mainstay of this person's therapy when they get to the medical floor is IV diuresis. IV diuresis is important for three reasons. First, IV diuretics are generally more potent than PO diuretics. For Lasix, we think of a two to one ratio of IV to PO. With that said, we will often have the heart failure patient who says, Doc, I was taking my increased doses of Lasix at home just like my heart failure doctor told me, and I still couldn't improve my symptoms. So there must be something more than just to explain the, the power of the medication. Uh, and there are two other factors. One is that Lasix has some prominent venous dilatory effects, which can uh, decrease the preload and actually improve cardiac pump function. And it turns out that the IV form of the medication does this more prominently than the PO form of the medication. Probably more importantly is the second reason, where if the person has any signs or symptoms of right heart failure, then in addition to the jugular venous distension you'll see on exam, the lower extremity edema you'll see on exam, the congestive hepatopathy you'll see on lab work, these patients will often have a component of gut edema. And this gut wall edema is going to prevent absorption of their PO medications, Lasix included. So oftentimes the, the importance of the IV diuresis is in the bioavailability of the IV medication. These patients will often require a 24 to 72 hour hospital stay where they'll initially be treated with IV diuretics. They'll be pulled back up their Starling curve, re-enter this top portion of the, of the ideal curve, where they are dry, euvolemic, and they'll often be discharged home, usually on the same PO diuretic regimen that they came in on. Now, let's take a slightly more complicated heart failure patient who presents to the Bigelow. Let's say that with your, with your diuresis attempts, they're not improving, their symptoms are not improving, and they actually might be worsening from a perfusion standpoint. So what does worse perfusion mean? 
It can be acute kidney injury due to renal malperfusion. It can be altered mental status due to cerebral malperfusion. It can be demand ischemia due to coronary malperfusion. So as you diurese these people and they start to worsen, you begin to think to yourself, did I incorrectly assess this person's location on their Starling curve? And volume assessment can be very difficult in these patients. Uh, you know, neck exam, lower extremity exam can often be limited by chronic changes or body habitus. And lab evaluation is often difficult um, due to concurrent renal or kidney disease. So you begin to think to yourself, maybe is this patient on the dry side of their Starling curve? And as I've diuresed them, I've actually pulled them more and more dry, and they're starting to have, have issues with perfusion for that standpoint. Now that's a reasonable thought, and oftentimes you do try small fluid boluses in these people to try to bring them back up their Starling curve. The other thing to consider, though, is that you did correctly assess this patient as being on the wet side of their Starling curve. They were just much further off the Starling curve than you thought. For me, it's helpful to have a, secondary, a second imaginary line here and where this represents the transition from dry to wet, this line represents the transition from warm to cold and the onset of malperfusion. So the question is, why is your IV, IV diuretic strategy not working in these patients? And the, renal, the reason is because of the cold kidneys that we discussed. If a person's kidneys are not being perfused with blood, then they will not remove volume from the body um, for physiologic reasons. And so the management here for this patient is not on the Bigelow. They need to be managed in the CCU because their management is guided not only by IV diuresis but also by pump support. And pump support is in one of two flavors. It can be with an inodilator such as dibutamine and milrinone or a more traditional presser such as levofed. The difference in choice here is based mostly on the effect on systemic vascular resistance. Um, but that's somewhat of a different discussion. So the goal of treating these patients would be with pump improvement to perfuse the kidneys. Once the kidneys are perfused, you move the patient from the cold category to the warm category. When the patient is stably warm, they can be moved from a CCU setting to either a medical floor or a step-down setting. And then their hospital stay with continue, will continue with likely one to three days of IV diuresis and they'll get pulled from the wet portion of the curve to the dry portion of the curve, at which point they'll be discharged back to the care of the heart failure clinic, um, usually, again, on a standing PO diuretic dose. So you can see very nicely here how these patients can bounce around the boxes of the heart failure uh, and how that correlates to their position on the Starling curve and their symptomatology. We leave this box out because it's somewhat of a different story and is not really pathophysiologically related to the first three boxes. These patients are dry and cold, and so one of two things is going on. Either it's the situation we discussed further, where the patient has either been overdiuresed or has volume loss for another reason, and they're all the way over here on the left side of their Starling curve, meaning they are cold because they're dry, and this person is not having a heart failure exacerbation at all. This person needs fluid resuscitation. The other possibility is that we're operating on a completely different Starling curve. And this person's Starling curve looks much more like this. Which is to say that while volume does play somewhat of a role in their pump function, these patients more so have end-stage pump dysfunction that is unrelated to their volume status, i.e. they're cold independent of volume status. These patients have end-stage heart failure and they need pump support medically with inotropes or pressors. Uh, and they need procedural or surgical support, typically with a VAD or a heart transplant. These patients end up in this box due to multiple circles around the heart failure box, as we've discussed, multiple past ischemic events, or end-stage heart failure due to a number one, a number of, one of a number of other etiologies. So this can provide you with a nice 10,000 foot view approach for how to think through heart failure patients and manage them while they're in the hospital. Thanks for watching.